I saw on the news about a week ago, and I say the news, that which was scrolling by my Facebook news feed, but I saw on the news about a week ago a lady in Spain who was well over 100 years old who recovered from the Spanish flu and now recovered from COVID-19. And of course, there were a million comments that said, praise the Lord. The thing that occurred to me was, <clears throat> we have no idea whether she was ready to go and be with the Lord or not. In fact, we see this all the time with the best of intentions saying, so-and-so recovered from whatever, praise be to God. God is good. And the question must be asked, what about all those other people who did not recover? You see, God is always good. But we have this tendency that when we see something that we want to see, we say, ah, there's God. God is good. Because I got up this morning, the million people who maybe died in their sleep last night, well, not a million, but what about that? We say, that person that I love recovered, thanks be to God. What about the people someone else loved who did not recover? People who die suddenly in car accidents, people who are struck by lightning. We have no idea <clears throat> any number of things that happen in the world, good, bad, and different, not always even leading to death. And yet, this constant, we praise God for the things that we desire. Because in those things, we say, ah, there's God. God gave me that. What does this have to do with the biblical text? Well, what's interesting first, and I mentioned this a week ago, there's always these interesting clues tucked in the liturgy that has been at least 17 centuries with us. And the prayer for the day, the colic for the day, does it again. It tells us what they were thinking about the readings when they composed the liturgy. By your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, do them. Because this is precisely where the apostles get it completely wrong in the gospel text. Jesus, in the gospel of John, and it's because John is good at remembering all of this stuff, it's hard for us to sort out. John was good with it, so we have all those statements in the Gospel of John where Jesus talks about the Holy Trinity. For I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and if you are in me, you are in the Father, and the Holy Spirit is in you, and the Holy Spirit will be with us. And sometimes it's a circle where we get our head hurts. John records it because he remembers it all. He didn't miss nothing. He's a lot smarter than I am. So John is the one that remembers these statements when the other witnesses don't always, and he writes it down for us. And Jesus is really no less confusing right now in this text from the Gospel of John. He says, don't ask anything in my name. Up until now you haven't asked. Ask the Father and the Father will give it to you because of me. Because you've believed in me, the Father will. And after he finishes this, the disciples say, what? Now you are not using figures of speech. Now we know exactly what you just said. To which Jesus said, oh my gosh, no you don't. Well, he says, now do you believe? You're all going to abandon me shortly. They believe or say that they do, not because of what Jesus said, but because of what they heard. What they heard was, ask anything in my name and it will be given to you. This is most certainly true. But in our weakness and our sin, without the right understanding of how the gospel of Jesus Christ works, what that sounded like was God is a cosmic jack-in-the-box, and when you turn it just the right number of times, he will pop up, and like a genie from Arabian myth, he will grant you your wishes. Anything you ask for, ask for that winning lottery ticket. Ask that your loved one get better. Forget all the other people. Ask that your job gets better. Ask that your life improves. Ask for it to rain money from heaven. Ask anything Jesus says in my name and you will get it. And what the disciples hear is, aha, now, now is the time. We have stuck with him because we recognize him from the prophecies, but he's not told us anything that we've wanted to hear. He keeps telling us to love our enemies and forgive the people who abuse us. And when do we get the kingdom on earth? When do we get the power? 
When do we get the wealth? When does Israel become a strong empire again? When do we get rewarded for having stuck with him to be at his right and his left in his kingdom of glory? And now they've heard it. Jesus is leaving this world and he's going to the Father and once he's there, anything they ask for, bam, it's theirs. Now this is good, they say. Now we know you come from God because you told us what we wanted to hear. Now we believe and we know for sure this isn't a figure of speech because however convoluted it is, we heard what we wanted to hear out of it and it made sense to us. And now we suddenly believe. And Jesus says, and now you believe? You're all going to abandon me when they take me away to the cross. Peter will deny three times that he even knows me. John will run away so fast he will lose his clothing and flee naked into the woods. These are the guys that say, we believe in you. And the answer for what is the difference between right now in the gospel text and when they flee, because what they just heard was they're going to get whatever they want. And when they get what they need, instead of what they want, when Jesus is taken to the cross to die for the sins of the world, that thing they've told him not to do because they don't understand it, the thing to which Peter said, never you, Lord, then they run away because they don't comprehend it, they don't understand it, and it's not simple. Where's the God who's the jack in the box? Do the right prayer the right way and the right ritual and God will pop out. That is not how it works. Hence the prayer, not like the apostles in our gospel text, but Lord, of your holy inspiration, help us to think those things that are right and by your merciful guiding, do them. So what is it then when Jesus says, ask anything in my name and you will get it? If it's not the genie out of the bottle that gives you whatever you want, what is it that Jesus is talking about? The truth is, God answers every single prayer every single time. Most of the time, the answer is no. A lot of times, the answer is maybe. Even more so, the answer is wait. We spend years praying for things that we don't see develop, and then we see it. Because one thing leads to another, leads to another. If you ask for God to help you with anything difficult in your life, be sure that he will. But he will not do it the way you want him to. Say, Lord, help me break my addiction. He will not necessarily immediately take it away. Miracles happen. But he may provide you with difficult, struggling, miserable, blood, sweat, and tears opportunity over a set of years that you get through it. God, help me get through my divorce. God, help me get through the loss of my job. God, help my family and loved ones. Sometimes, perhaps, the best thing for those loved ones is to die from this world, that they might go and be with Jesus. God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. There's a great story from the early church about the ministry of St. Peter where a single father came and asked Peter to pray for his only daughter that the best would happen for her. Peter offered the prayer, and the girl died immediately on the spot. And when the man blasphemed and renounced God, the girl woke up and came back to life. The next day, she was brutally raped and murdered by a Roman legion in the vicinity. God allowed her to fall asleep immediately in the grace of Jesus Christ and go to heaven, God knows the future, and God works it out for the best. We're children. If your children ask you for something dangerous, you tell them no. If your children want to drink something poisonous, you take it away. Why would we imagine that the infinite and almighty God wants to grant our wishes, giving us literally anything we ask for? Rather, he does what any loving parent would do, and he gives us what we need not what we want. Because even you and I who are called here to the merciful goodness of Jesus in the waters of baptism and in Holy Eucharist, we are still plugged firmly with a foot in this world and we are sinners of sinful flesh and rebellious souls. We are not perfect. We don't even know the things we should ask for except that God makes it possible for us to ask for the right thing. Paul says, we don't even know what to pray. 
but that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with a groaning that is beyond human comprehension. We pray for our silly, short-sighted, selfish, personal needs, and the Holy Spirit, in his groaning, puts before God Almighty what it is that we actually need day by day, minute by minute, breath by breath. We know not, apart from him, what even to ask for, but of course he gives us what is good. The apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ were looking for the answer to what they wanted. They already had in their mind, just like the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what the Christ would be like, what the future empire of Israel would look like, what dominating the world and killing off all of their pagan enemies would look like. They hungered for it, and the only difference between the apostles of our Lord and those enemies is that the apostles knew that Jesus was the Christ. They were confused and befuddled by the things that he said and did, but they knew he was the real deal, and so they had to be led. The enemies of Jesus had figured it out. He's not the Christ, because he's not the Christ we want. He doesn't tell us what we want to hear. He's not going to do the things that we've decided he ought to do. He's not going to be the person we want him to be. Therefore, they reject him entirely. He cannot be the real deal. Because we in our sins are selfish, interned, twisted, self-centered people. And it is so hard to be outside of ourselves. And that's what the Spirit does. The Spirit comes in us to turn us out to allow us to see others, to do incredible, miraculous, and impossible things that we sinners could never do, like love one another, be good to our neighbor, forgive people, come to church, things that make absolutely no sense to our sinful flesh and our rebellious spirit. If we were unbelievers, we would be much better off sleeping in on a Sunday but we are filled with the Holy Ghost to make us do those things that don't come natural to us. And he does make sure that all of our prayers are answered. The apostles prove who they are, sinful humans, because they always get it wrong, like we usually do. They always turn away, like we usually do. And they flee from Jesus at the critical moment when he finally goes to his kingdom of his glory his glory on the cross to die for the sins of the world. He will have a thief, thieves and murderers to his right and left in his kingdom because his apostles have hightailed it out. And yet like them, those apostles, like that one thief on the cross, we are called by the Spirit to be something different than what we are. And that is to be called back continually to the feet of Jesus by his holy inspiration he can make us even think things that are right, which is beyond us without him. And by his merciful guiding, he can get them done. Things like love and forgiveness, looking out to others, being not so self-centered, being guided to look at the cross of Jesus, where Jesus empties himself of everything. The eternal God infinite across all the multiverse who made it all and made us in his image makes himself so small as to die on a cross that we built with nails that we drove into him just to take away our sin so he could draw us to himself and in that reveal his will which is love and forgiveness and unity and peace and wisdom all coming from the throne of God Almighty down to us who need it. The things we don't know to pray for, the Spirit puts inside us. The things we can't even get out, the Spirit prays on our behalf. And the cross of Jesus becomes the center that marks the spot in our hearts, in our world, in the cosmos, in everything, to turn us back to Him, away from our selfish desires and our impulses, to what we needed all along, a God who forgives, not what we want, which is always corrupted by us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.